Okay, then I'll start. My name is Sophia Zinder. I'm here on behalf of the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiative, and we are having tonight's lecture on how to transform a city with walking and cycling for and after COVID-19. Tonight with Will Mormon, a walking and cycling commissioner um, of the City of London, and Vidya Mohankumar, founder and principal of the Urban Design Collective. We have a little change of plans. Our moderator from ITVP, Claire Burundi, has a has a family emergency, so she can't join us today. But we'll keep this lecture going as part of, of our Tumi summer school. And so without further ado, I'll introduce to you Will Norman, Walking and Cycling Commissioner of the City of London. Uh, Dr. Will Norman is London's first uh, Walking and Cycling Commissioner, working to deliver the Mayor's pledges to make walking and cycling safer and easier in the capital of Great Britain. Um, Will was previously Director of Global Partnerships at Nike, and he spent more than three years working with non-profit organizations, governments, UN agencies and European institutions to tackle the global inactivity crisis, as he says, uh, with a particular focus on getting children more active. And we'll now hear a short uh, presentation from him on walking and cycling in London before and during COVID-19. So we'll, I'll hand over the word to you. Thanks ever so much. Um, I uh, can't seem to operate the slides, so I'm going to ask you to show some, show some slides. That'd be great. So yeah, my name's Will. I'm the Mayor of London's Walking and Cycling Commissioner. And I suppose my job is pretty straightforward. It's to get more people walking and, and cycling in London. I've been doing this for about three years, three and a half years now as part of the Mayor's Transport Strategy. And also, obviously, in the last six months, I've overseen a lot of the work that we've been doing on COVID. Can I have the next slide, please? So since the mayor was elected in 2016, so this is me and the mayor out on our, our bikes, but since we were elected in 2016, the mayor, Sidi Khan, put active travel at the very heart of his transport strategy, setting a, for this 25 year strategy, setting a goal of how can we get to 80% of all our journeys by being walked, cycled, or using public transport. And so as part of that, we've been re investing record amounts of money in, uh, in, in, in active travel, and particularly cycling infrastructure. So in the last four years, we've tripled the amount of protected cycling lanes in London as part of our overall sort of drive for uh, to enable more people to, to walk and cycle. Uh, could I have the next slide? So, as with everywhere else in the world, you know, the UK went into a pretty, stro a pretty strong lockdown in back in March. The pubs, the restaurants, the shops were all closed and Londoners were really only able to leave the house if they had to work, if they, if they needed to go and get food or they needed to get some daily exercise. Um, but for those people who were out and about, particularly for being, uh, for, for particularly for those people who were exercising during lockdown, one of the silver linings to this very dark crowd was that there was a lot less traffic on our roads. This is an image just behind Number Ten Downing Street, the Prime Minister's uh, residence. And in normal times, this would be clogged up with traffic. But during during COVID, with no traffic, suddenly it was a pleasant environment for families to ride their bikes. Could I have the next slide, please? And. One of the things that we found in, in London and, and you know, across the world we see this is that the biggest thing that stops people cycling is not feeling safe and largely because there's too much traffic. So when the traffic went away, uh, what we saw was everybody starting to cycle and we saw a glimpse of what we had been really working towards with our healthy streets uh, strategy. Um, and we, when we looked at the data, you can see that cycling is the only form of mode of transport where numbers have gone up. So bus numbers are down, train numbers are down, the underground numbers are down, motor traffic is pretty much back to normal, but cycling is up and is up significantly. Could I have the uh, next slide, please? If we come back to why this is such a, why have we got to change the way we're moving around our city? Why, why is this so, so important? This graph really shows the blue graph on, the, on, the, on, on one side of the screen shows the demand for transport before COVID. And it really sets out the challenge here that if you look at those two lines, you can see a lot of people traveling in the morning and a lot of people tra traveling in the in the evening. But with social distancing, you can't we can't run the survey, the, the, you know, not as many people can get on the on the buses. So, for example, or on the tubes. So, for example, buses usually carry about 80 people uh, in London uh, with at the moment with social distancing regulations. They're only about they can only carry 33. So if you look at that red line, network capacity, if you're running 100% of the tubes and 100% of the buses with two meters social distancing, that's how many people you can carry. 
if you've got one meter social distancing, that how much, that's how many people you can carry. So as as things began to ease up and traffic started to increase over the summer, we knew that the 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 the, the, the streets wouldn't stay stay long, uh, stay quiet for long, and we had to enable more people to walk and cycle. The risk is that even if a fraction of those journeys that aren't being made by public transport end up on the roads, end up being done by motor traffic, we'll have gridlock in the city, we will have an air quality crisis, and that's the very th last thing we need in the, um, in the height of a respiratory disease. So can I have the next, uh, next slide, please? So part of our solution was this, what we called the street space plan. It was, a, it, it was a rapidly developed plan to really repurpose our streets so that um, away from motor traffic so that more people could walk and cycle. The first part of that plan, there are three parts, but the first part is more space for people in town centers. That's sort of looking at widening pavements and busy high streets, providing more people, more space for people at interchanges and people able to get to the shops. This is in South London, um, and it's a, usually a very busy road, typical big bus tube interchange, busy market, pubs, there's the concert venue, the Brixton Academy around the call, and there really isn't enough space. So if we have the next slide, you can see what we've done with that. We've widened the pavement by the bus stops to, to give more people space to socially distance using, you know, this literally went in overnight with a rubber curb and, uh, and filled it with tarmac. And if you look at the next slide, you know, the day after it went in, we saw people take to the ground with a whole load of chalk and people loved it. Reallocating space from cars for, for people. So the first point, um, the next slide, please. So in, in other areas of London, it was about closing off streets. This is uh, this is Broadway Market in Hackney in East London, a local high street which uh, was closed to traffic for to give more social distancing. The next slide shows what it used to be like and what it was normally like. You know, it had traffic. There were always trucks getting stuck in it. And I uh, cycled through this most days to get to work. It was pretty unpleasant. If you have a look at it now on the next slide, there's no there's no traffic. Uh, car, trucks and lorries can still get access to the businesses, but there's space for social distancing. You're seeing people, kids cycling on it and people uh, walking up and down and the business is doing really well. The second, if we have the next slide, please. The second area of our, uh, the second major area of our focus for transforming London uh, for after COVID is the street space plan was looking at the strategic cycle network. So we started planning and building a, 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 a strategic cycling net, network, network using temporary materials. You can see these, these blue uh, water-filled containers in the background. This was partly accelerating our existing plan, but also looking at new routes that would sort of help reduce overcrowding on public transport routes. This was on Park Lane. It was one of the first schemes that we delivered. And if you look at the next slide, um, what it used to be like, it was a one, two, three, four lanes in one direction. It's essentially a motorway through the middle of our city and one of our parks. It was 40 miles an hour. And if you go back a slide, it's now got this, um, it's, if you go back one slide, you've now got the cycle lane. It's 20 miles an hour, people using that in, instead. Um, if we skip forward two slides, <clears throat> we've also looked at improving our existing. This was one of the first bike lanes put in London about 10 years ago it's essentially paint on the road and it doesn't provide adequate protection. If you go to the next slide, one of the things that we've been doing is upgrading some of that very quickly, providing protective ones, making it wider. The next slide shows how by the Tate Britain in central London, you've got people, you know, to, if you can imagine cycling along the blue bike lane and a bus comes into that bus stop, uh, you've then got a clash between buses and cyclists. You look at the next slide, what we've done is put in a temporary facility called a bus stop bypass which provides cyclists with a not, lot more protection and the buses stop on that island. Um, so in the next the next slide shows the scale. These are two examples of routes but over the last since May we've put in about 80 kilometers of new cycle routes which was you know which is a really significant amount that's more than we inherited four years ago in the whole of London. So that's gone in, in since May and it shows the scale of the cycle network that we're, that we're, we're delivering. The third area of focus, if you go on to the next slide, is about residential streets. So we looked at high streets and town centres. You look at a strategic cycle network. But one of the silver linings, as I said, was in London, was watching young kids this age cycling around the streets, walking around the streets, getting some physical activity uh, on these quieter roads. And so we're working with the London councils, all the boroughs, 
to reduce traffic on residential roads, reduce people cutting through those areas, creating low traffic neighborhoods, enabling more people to walk and cycle as part of those local journeys to local shops, to schools. It's been pioneered by a borough in a London called Waltham Forest, and we're looking to replicate that across the, across the city. And it's a pretty cheap way of, uh, of humanizing our streets, designing streets for people. I don't like calling roads closed. I think they're open to people who are walking, cycling, using wheelchairs and, uh, and the way. And the next next slide. Um, next slide shows, you know, just how, you know, you know, when 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 these when these when these it's, it's a challenge talking about this sort of closing roads, uh, how how the sort of how how we discuss them and how we talk about this about this to people who don't know what they are. But once they're in and you understand it, there are, you know, very few people would not want their neighborhoods to look a bit more like this rather than the, the traffic dominated spaces. You go on to the next slide, you can see that other boroughs and other areas of London are doing the same thing. In this part of Lambeth in South London, uh, we've got six, six access only streets have basically created about four miles of low traffic neighborhoods uh, connecting communities to their shops in, in, in the south of London. Next slide shows that you know there are other things that we're doing creatively by putting a by taking out a parking space for cars you can add a bit of greenery there's space for bike parking and transforming those streets again trying to reduce the domination of cars but if you go on to the next slide i'm not going to lie to anyone I'm, this stuff is, is is not easy it's not all plain sailing you know we have i think we have a number of well i know we have a number of court cases against us with people trying to take us to court for what we're doing under the guise that we are blocking roads and we're, 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 we're so-called creating chaos. Um, the next slide, we've seen examples where some people really, really don't like these changes. And we know that change is challenging for a lot of people. But as we've, as we've learned over the past few years in London, that any change creates attention. There's a, usually a lot, of, um, a lot of noise from a vocal minority and it takes some, uh, some, some, a bit of time to adjust. But it requires political bravery to hang in there. It takes a political, you know, it, you need that political support to, uh, to, um, to, to maintain it. And it's a good example where the right transport policy is not easiest, the, always the easiest to deliver for politicians. If we go on to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things that's been wonderful seeing is as, uh, as lockdown was lifted over the summer, if we go on to the next slide, pubs and restaurants started to opening. And as we saw around the world, pre, you know, cars began, uh, uh, cities began to rethink their, 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 their city without cars. Go on to the next slide. Um, and these streets became places where people could eat and drink, allow those sort of those, uh, those, 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 uh, you know, those, those businesses. Run. This one's in, uh, in Clapham in, in South London. If you go on to the next slide, you know, you can see it's a, a bustling area. It's helped, it's helped keep businesses open and running in a particular challenging time and if you go on to the next slide that's what it used to look like um, so that's what it used to look like and if we flip back uh, that's what it looks like today uh, and uh, <clears throat> this is being replicated all over the city so if you go forward uh, two slides please uh, here we go this is Soho in the center of London's sort of theater land lots of bars this is what it used to look like this is what it looks like now if you go on to the next slide um, you can see this transforming the streets for, for people. This is not just good for transport. This is not just good for our health in terms of getting people physically active. This is also really important for the recovery and the economic recovery of, of London and our shops, our restaurants and our culture, which makes London the, one of the greatest cities in, in the world. We have to retain it and rethinking our streets so that they're streets for people are, is, is essential. So can we skip ahead two, two slides and I'll, I'll wrap up and then maybe uh, we can go into the con uh, next presentation. So if I was going to start summarize, everything changed in the last six months, but at the same time, nothing's changed. We already had a, a strategy to get more people walking and cycling and we were making good progress towards that. But because of the crisis and for London to come out and recover in a greener, cleaner uh, way, it, you know, we've had to accelerate those plans. What we were delivering in year, months and years, we've been doing in days and weeks. Um, but by doing things much faster than we've ever done and for a fraction of the cost, which, which is a great way of doing it, but we, we have to keep that momentum up. But that, that, the under, this takes political will. It needs political support. It needs support from people. And we need everybody to be vocal in terms of the changes that they want to see as part of the change in, in, in London. 
So that's a little bit of a flavor of what we've been up to here. Hello? Ah, hi, sorry. Uh, ah, there we go. So thank you very much, Will, for this super interesting presentation. And I ask all the participants to write down their questions here in the chat we'll keep, or, or in, in mind so that we can answer them later after our panel discussion, to which I now uh, invite Vidya Mohankuma. She's a founder and principal of the Urban Design Collective. Vidya is an architect and urban designer with over 15 years of work experience in India, Ireland and the United States. And her work was focused on creating cities that are people oriented and centered around transit as part of the sustainable development agenda. And her approach is driven by research that is grounded and intersectional as a way to understand the everyday urbanism in cities. In 2011, Vidya founded the Urban Design Collective, an urban and a collaborative, sorry, a collaborative platform for architects, urban designers, and planners to create livable cities through participatory planning. And so we will now deep dive into our panel discussion. And um, to kick it off, maybe uh, I ask the, the question to both of you directly and whomever feels free uh, uh, feels to, to answer it. So what do you think? Why has walking and cycling as a means to counter COVID-19 been so successful? We heard some examples, but like, what do you think are the top priorities why it became so successful? Video, I've spoken very, why don't you go first? Uh, no, not yet. I think you might be on mute. Uh, we were able to hear before. How about now? No, yes. Yes. No. Is it fine now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, got it. All right. Um, thanks, Will. That was a very inspiring presentation. Um, I just um, uh, so if you just to before I sort of take your question, I sure. I just thought I you know um. Since I, I'm not presenting um, slides, I just thought I'd give, give you kind of an overview of um, the walking and cycling scene uh, in in the Indian context. Um, so um, just to just to sort of uh, set the set the tone here, like um, predominantly cycling was a mode of transport, um, and even in the post-independence era, which is um, since 1947. Uh, we've it, it, and and all through the industrial uh, era, you know, like oh, cycling was a very very um, key aspect of the modal share uh, in any city. Um, um, it, it was a very common sight in cities to see factory workers uh, driving their cycle and getting to work. Um, so what changed was uh, in the post liberalization era uh, when there was uh, you know a, a sort of relaxation of foreign investment and there was you know it really opened up an economic boom for the for the country as such and um, so with it came um, an increase in prosperity and increase in disposable income uh, amongst all the citizens and um, I think that was really the turning point and that increase in prosperity um, unfortunately led to the proliferation of several you know unsustainable modes of transport um, owning your personal vehicle became uh, a matter of pride. And um, I know a lot of cities have the same story, but just in terms of a timeline, this happened in the 90s. Uh, so there, there, there has been a very, very steep rise in the number of privately owned vehicles on the streets uh, since the 90s. Um, it hasn't helped that public transport hasn't you know, seen a large amount of investment in terms of what, it, what could be done to improve it. So it kind of, you know, has uh, there is there is a stigma with public transport in the sense that it is seen, it is still perceived as a poor man's mode of transport, and um, everyone, you know, in their climbing the ladder of success, like you, you're in the bus, you want to get out of the bus, and you want to get into a two wheeler first, and then from there on, you want to get into a car, and so on. Um, so, like. Like about 10 years ago, uh, the city that I live in, Chennai, was recording, was registering a thousand vehicles every single day. You know, they were so, which means that we were adding a thousand vehicles, and this includes commercial as well as pri uh, personal and private vehicles. But 
I mean, your road capacity is isn't increasing, and there's no. I mean, there's there's no way that that's going to increase. But you're you're adding a thousand vehicles every day onto the street, and that's definitely not auguring well for the city. Uh, so uh, we've we've been seeing. Uh, I think in the the 90s until the early 2000s was that era when you know we we saw traffic congestion as a as a huge problem in several Indian cities, and um, much like many uh, developed countries, uh, we, we were making the mistake of putting in flyovers. But we, we saw, again, a proliferation of flyovers as, as ways to combat congestion. Uh, but the focus towards non-motorized transport as a solution, as a viable solution to deal with uh, congestion actually only emerged, I would say, in um, around um, 2000, eight, nine, ten onwards. Like so literally only over the past decade has there been a shift towards um, non-motorized transport. The conversations and diet debates around non-motorized transport have been on the rise in the country, across the country in several cities, uh, only only over the past decade. Um, so uh, it also helped uh, that uh, the Smart City mission, which was launched in the in 2016, um, enabled several cities to look at um, bicycle sharing as a viable um, mode of uh, transport that could be installed in all of the cities. So several cities looked at uh, pan-city uh, networks of bicycling and the installation of public bike, bicycle sharing systems. Um, it was encouraged by the Smart City mission. Uh, Parallel to this, we also saw several cities going in for metro construction. So there, there, the talks about integrating metro with public bike sharing, all of it started only, you know, in the last say five, six years is, is where we are at if I was to give you a timeline. Right. So this is where we're at. But but the stigma, the 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 stigma associated with cycling and public transport is still very, very largely unaddressed. Uh, so despite a lot of investment from a lot of cities going into the into the construction of um, metros in uh, and the installation of uh, public bike sharing systems in several, it, we have 100 smart cities, uh, designated smart cities across the country. And all of them have a component of a public bike sharing system that needs to be installed. Uh, but very few have seen success. Very few have actually gone ahead and managed to install it. There are a lot of other problems associated with it, which is largely related to procurement and tendering and finding somebody who can actually, uh, you know, uh, put in a system like this and run it. Uh, and it's, it's not easy, you know, as a transport planning system, bike sharing is not as easy as it sounds. That, you know, it's not like you just put a few cycles out there and people start using it. Uh, the other thing that's missing, of course, as Will pointed out, is in infrastructure. You know, you don't put in a public bike sharing system without the infrastructure for someone to ride the bicycles on. So we're still kind of like, you know, in this, you know, weird uh, stage where we're where we want to get there, but we're not figuring out, you know, we're not putting all the pieces of the puzzle are not in there yet. Um, now, uh, fast forwarding back right now to where we are with COVID, um, a very interesting uh, development has been, of course, that, you know, all public transport has been suspended since March. Our country has been in lockdown since March and um, in um, if, if I if I get it get it right in June, uh, there was um, a challenge that was launched again under the Smart City Mission. It's called Cycles for Change. Uh, Cycles for Change encouraged cities to apply for this challenge, and as part of the challenge, what they had to do was, as a COVID response, uh, pilot a five-kilometer network of a cycle lane in their city, and also um, you know, complementary to that, come up with a cycle network. Um, like, I mean, uh, the, the, the network map that Will showed us for London, like, I mean, that's, that's where, that's the sort of goal, you know, like, that they need to sort of, they need to come up with a network map that covers the, the larger expanse of the city, uh, if possible, integrated with the public bike sharing systems, which are either in the planning stage or in the, you know, implementation stage. And um, uh, by, uh, so the challenge is currently ongoing. We have 90 plus cities that have registered for the challenge. and. Um, um, we are currently working with Kochi to help uh, Kochi install uh, this pilot of five kilometers and also um, get their network in place and make sure that the pilot integrates with the larger network uh, as, as, as an effort towards scaling up. 
Um, so that's where we're at. Um, I, I, it's it's interesting that you know um, COVID has you know sort of opened up opened up this window of opportunity uh, that so many you know and a whole decade of efforts uh, towards promoting non-motorized transport has has been largely unsuccessful. Uh, so right now, uh, uh, cities that are part of the Cycles for Change Challenge are looking to integrate with their uh, larger mass transit systems, uh, metro lines, public bus sharing, and um, any other you know sort of uh, um, efforts that have gone into the realm of, of walking and cycling in the city, and as a way to consolidate everything. So um, that's um, reporting from here. <laughs> Great, thank you, Vidya. Yeah, please. It's it's really interesting hearing that, and you know, having having been to India and worked elsewhere in the world, it's it is amazing how for so long our cities have been designed around the private car, and uh, and just how detrimental that has been to our health through air quality, but just how inactive our populations have become, and you know, in many ways, that inactivity crisis is a ticking time bomb for our health, and uh, you know, for. When you sort of t look into COVID, it seems, as I said, it's changed everything and it's changed nothing. It's it's accelerated things. It's shown some of the um, the challenges that we, we all face that were already there. But I think, you know, a couple of things that have really affected London is that I've never heard, you know, during lockdown, we had um, the prime minister or a minister or a senior government official on TV every day giving an update. And one of the things they said every day was do some exercise, you know, get out and go for a walk get on a bike. You know, this was every day on our TV screens. That's that's never been, been the case. So this sort of this language of making sure that people stay fit and healthy, I think is not just important during the first wave of COVID, but it's going to be important for how we keep our cities as resilient as possible to what is likely to be a long haul. Uh, and we know that if people are physically active, then they are much less likely for a whole range of different health reasons. So I think that's one driver that has that has come into this. But I think the biggest driver in so much of this is that it's actually just quite fun. You know, when people have been in lockdown and whatever, we saw more people out on their bikes or or getting these old bikes out of their sheds and off their balconies and and fixing them up or kids getting on the bikes or or or, or our high, we do have a, a higher bike system a, uh, which which has seen such the biggest record increases ever and during lockdown when it was quiet and it was enjoyable and people wanted to do some exercise they started re, re, reclaiming their streets people were using the parks more people were using our green spaces more and there are large parts of our city like every city which don't have green spaces. So they started using their streets in a different way. And I think that what we're seeing now, when, when people have done that, they find actually it's not that hard cycling in London. It's quite quick, it's free, it's fun. It's, uh, you know, my, you know, look at my kids, they started cycling around and they've suddenly got this degree of freedom that they didn't have, have before. And I think that's what's, it's shifted now that we have, you know, things have, things have they've come a bit back to normal they're not back to normal but it's come back and who knows what's going to happen next but that some of those behaviors have 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 carried on and then at the same time people are worried and and and, and people are worried about the virus people are want to socially distance they're afraid to get on the underground you know the the tube in london is famous you know everybody knows the london underground system but it's currently operating during the height of lockdown it was carrying about five percent of the previous numbers of passengers at the moment it's carrying 35 percent so you know there's a huge number of people who aren't using that and so not everybody has access to a car they so they're, they're walking and cycling more for those journeys but i think you know covid is one crisis that we're facing and uh, you know we also have climate change and we also have air, you know the, the issues around that the fires on the west coast you know the, the flooding as we're around, around the world all the challenges that it's it's you know we're seeing the the realities of, of climate change kicking in so and again people are trying to take more responsible actions i think and it's part of a, a sort of a synergy these venn diagrams are coming together the sort of the health aspect the transport aspect the environmental piece and then layer on the fact that it's actually pretty enjoyable and it's good for our well-being you know it is a it is a um you know as i said earlier i i I really hope that this is a, a silver lining to what is a horribly, horribly dark cloud. 
But yeah, I would like to uh, dive in into that because you said a very interesting sentence uh, about the stigmatization still of walking and cycling. And now we see, of course, um, numbers in cycling going up and, and Will mentioned, okay, the fun and the worries could be uh, reasons for that. But with the stigma of walking and cycling in many of uh, developing and emerging countries in mind, what is your opinion, opinion about that? Um, so I think, um, um, as Will pointed out, we, we've seen a bit of a surge in recreational cycling as well. Um, so um, offices are still not fully operational. So the, the sort of, uh, when, I, when I meant earlier that the cycling was a very important part of the modal split, uh, it, was, it was because it was part of, it was, it was part of the daily commute. Uh, people would cycle to work, yeah. people would cycle to school, people would cycle to college. Uh, but they stopped doing that. Um, there has been a surge in recreational cycling, although I have to say it's, it's only among the more affluent uh, folks. Uh, so there are cycling clubs and um, several of these clubs organize um, uh, cycling tours in, you know, um, sort of the fringe areas of the city that are, um, you know, not as polluted and um, as Will pointed out, Air, air quality is a huge deterrent to people cycling. You don't want to be, you know, you, you want to be sustainable, you want to be on a bicycle, but you don't want to come back with asthma. <laughs> so um, the air, and I think uh, what COVID has done is there has been um, a significant reduction in particulate matter in, in, in the air and, and uh, Chennai uh, as well has, and, and pretty much many of the metro cities, Chennai, Bangalore and Bombay actually re reported uh, or reported uh, very, very low levels of pollution all through the lockdown period. Um, I mean, of course, you know, it, it, it's it's not rocket science. You're, you're, the number of vehicles on the street are very less. So it's, it's one thing is it frees up space for a cyclist. And second, you don't have them, you know, breathing out. You don't, you don't have them breathing in what's coming out of these vehicles. Um, so it has recreational cycling has picked up in several cities, um, more so in tier two cities where, you know, already the air level, air quality levels were not that um, that bad. Um, but I think what the what the challenge is doing is is also encouraging cities to use this as an opportunity to make it the new normal. Like, you know, um, yes, people are out there uh, cycling for recreation, but maybe they like the taste of it. And, you know, and if we actually manage to put in the dedicated infrastructure and uh, integrated with mass transit, then we're probably going to be able to keep many of those private vehicles off the roads. So I think it's a it's an interesting um, move. Uh, and um, I mean, uh, as I said, you know, it's uh, the the challenge is on till December, so we will not know the results until say January or February. But uh, but it's an interesting moment, and it's an interesting opportunity to capitalize on. Um, yeah, I guess, you know, all the, you know, all the ser serendipitously, you know, all of the things are coming together <laughs> in some way. You said this very nice sentence of making cycling the new normal. And I think uh, all, all of us here in this room are kind of the um, advocates for that. Um, but <laughs> like, <laughs> if we see the current situation, and as we agree, we like that. How can it nudge also long-term transformation in, in our cities towards a higher share and active mobility modes in, in, in the long run? I think, uh, you know, in the long run, the only thing that is going to change um, our mode share is people feeling safer. Yeah, and and we've done research into this that we, you know, not not unlike India, you know, there is a stigma around, uh, you know, around around cycling and active travels. In from in, in, in for many, a, a car is a status symbol that still exists. You know, that's still part of a, a, a lot of people's thinking. But we know that if you know, we know that in every age group and in every and in every sort of cohort across the city whether it's uh, ethnicity it's uh, socioeconomic groups whether it's gender you make the road safer people will be more likely to to, to walk and cycle mm. so the only real way to actually change a city is to redesign it we've seen it in the netherlands we've seen it in copenhagen you know uh, we're seeing it in london we're seeing it in paris we're seeing it in bits of new york uh, and we're seeing it in you know smaller cities all around the world uh, uh, both, both both developed and developing 
uh, we need to make those roads safer. And if they're safer, if you build the bike infrastructure, people people will come. Um, so that has to be the, uh, the the long term goal here. But it is also about shifting conversations. It's shifting a culture. It's shifting behaviours. It's making it normal. Because bike bike infrastructure doesn't just materialise from outer space. You can't just suddenly one day dig up all the roads and put in a load of bike infrastructure because there's a little thing called politics that, that sort of allows these things to happen. So there has to be a demand for this stuff. People have to be asking for it. There has to be, you know, it, you, you need that public support. So there's a sort of aspect of actually... COVID has, has really raised active travel. I think certainly in, in the areas where I'm most familiar, it's raised it up the agenda. People are talking about it. People are getting on bikes. People are getting old bikes out of it, out of things. Our bike shops in, in London are running out. Of, they have run out of bikes. I, I keep going into bike shops and talking to the businesses and they just, they can't get hold of enough bikes to sell because people, people want them. They, if those people are then talking to their local politicians are talking to the local decision makers saying, we want our rider bikes. We want our kids to be able to walk to school. We want our kids to be able to cross the road safely. I want my kids to be able to cycle to the playground to play football or, or whatever it might be. Then suddenly you begin to get that infrastructure. So I think that COVID has not only ex ex accelerated the temporary infrastructure and the stuff that we can put down, which I, I showed you, but it's also brought up the level of public conversation about this. It's made it more of a I think it's it's beginning to make it more of a mainstream issue than just a, a minority issue. Um, it's not just certain groups. You know, when, in London, we often see it's an affluent group who do the sort of sports cycling and, and are part of a club and they're doing recreational cycling. But actually, it's making that normal. I, I, people shouldn't, I'm, I'm not interested in people wearing lycra to get around the city as if they're trying to do the Tour de France. I want people to just be wearing it their normal clothes if i'm going out for a drink i want to get on my bike i don't want to dress up in a like i'm trying to do a cycle race and then go to the pub you know that's not that's not how we should be living our lives so i hope that one of the things that is happening is that it's making it a part of a public conversation it's part of a normalizing something that uh, is and then from that more people will do things and that leads to more pressure on politicians and people like me to deliver things faster and with more public will behind us, it's easier to do that and uh, it's easier to overcome some of the hurdles. So I think this this idea, this cultural shift that Lydia talked to about, this sort of this idea of making this a, a new normal, the idea of making this open to everybody and it's not just seen as a minority uh, pursuit so, so that is, 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 is vitally important. Lydia, would you like to add? Sure. Um, and I mean, just in terms of the conversation on how to do this, right? I mean, of course, there's politics and of course, there's, uh, you know, the, the will to, to, to uh, actively push and drive this agenda. Uh, but I think uh, what um, um, what many cities are uh, looking at and um, is, is this uh, sort of new um, um, fascination with the tactical urbanism approach and I want to want to talk a little bit about that um, so um, I think you know again I think this really ties back into the political pressures to do something to show something on the ground to have something you know um, to talk about you know it, it's all about the buzz you know um, so um, tactical urbanism as an approach has has kind of really picked up and uh, over the past five years um, uh, Coinciding with the smart city mission and the promotion of bike sharing and the shift toward con conversations towards promoting non-motorized non transit infrastructure, uh, there have been several organizations, um, including GIZ, who, who you know we've, we've tested out tactical urbanism initiatives across several cities in India, um, and I think um, the transforming the city for walking and cycling, you know, really gets its push through tactical urbanism. So you're you're piloting something that's uh, temporary uh, on a trial basis. It allows cities to, to, to test out the idea of, you know, does this really work? Are there really takers? Um, and then, you know, like, uh, as so Will was talking about the demand, right? Like, how do you create that demand? And I think one way to create that demand is, to buy, is by putting in a temporary intervention through a tactical urbanism approach allowing uh, the people uh, of the city to experience what it is like to have a dedicated uh, piece of infrastructure that is focused on walking and cycling and you know encouraging them to use it 
Um, also, the you know, I mean, I, I think we all know the 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 one of the the sort of signature elements of tactical urbanism is this flash of color that it comes with. So the 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 color is enticing. The colors that you put on the on the floor are very enticing for someone to want to be on it. Uh, it's a great photo op for for many people, and it's really gets a lot of people curious and wanting to come and see what it is. So. Um, I think it's uh, it's it's also an interesting um, way to, um, to to drive that push towards walking and cycling, uh, especially in a COVID era. And and we've seen several cities going for this as well. Like like, listen, there's there's less traffic on the roads. Let's just take that one extra lane, put in a temporary thing. It's not going to cost as much, but at the same time, we get to test our idea. And if it if it like if if they like it, it sticks. You know. Yeah. So I think in terms of a strategy, um, it, it 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 is emerging um, as as a as a as a very preferred uh, way to go about um, enabling this shift. Yeah, I think you're right that it helps enable a shift, but I also think there are limits to tactical urbanism. So, Absolutely. for example, <laughs> uh, we've got at the moment, you know, where where the most dangerous points in our roads are the junctions. 80% of people who are injured on our roads, it happens at junctions where two roads uh, roads collide. Tackling some of those just through tactical urbanism and allowing the movement of vehicles. And, we, you know, let's be honest, we, we have to have some motor vehicles to make our, you know, our, our, our cities work. I'd like them to be cleaner. Um, I'd like them to be less, but we obviously need uh, we need uh, 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 people to move stuff around, and there are essential journeys that do need to be made cars. So there are some limits to tactical urbanism in terms of the quality of the, some of the schemes that can be done, not just in terms of how they look, but actually how they function from a transport uh, planning perspective. But I I do agree with you, and it's something that I found really exciting in London it's just the skill of the, the the guys across the whole guys and girls guys and girls across the whole city who are doing a brilliant job in rolling stuff out and and thinking just thinking differently and I think this sort of the tactical urban, urbanism is inspiring in the short term but it also seeds something in the long term about rethinking what is possible rethinking how we do things you know we might not be able to do everything in temporary materials and at the pace that we have been up until now, but it it, it shows that we can think differently, and that is a, a an incredibly exciting prospect, I think. It is, and um, um, Chris, Sophia, I don't know if it's possible, but I there's a, it, to share a video um, of a of a project that we did last year, and this was actually pre-COVID. Um, but but it inspired the city enough to want to take it up as a permanent intervention, and and that's that's where we're at. And this was again a project that we did with GIZ and in the city of Coimbatore. Um, I don't know if it's possible to accommodate this, but I do have a video, and I could post the link on the chat. That's great. Please post it yeah. in the chat. I think we for for this session we have uh, cut off the te the technical. Um, Stuff, so we can't, we, you wouldn't be able to hear the sound, but please, uh, all participants, feel free to to click on the link. But uh, one all right, I I put it yeah. on the chat there. Yeah. Um. I mean, if 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 it's um for anyone to look at, this was a project that we did last year in November, and um, uh, but we also pushed the limits on it, and we tested several other ideas in terms of enhancing the livability. So we had shade structures. We put in a bit of planting. To give them a natural feel of what the street could look like if it was made as a permanent intervention, um, I, it was. I think it was. It was. Uh, it was received very well by all of the, um, the the folks that walked along that street. Several of them, in fact, thought it was a permanent intervention, <laughs> and uh, uh, were a little upset when we told them that we had to uninstall it in in, in like about two three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it, but it was it was it, uh, it was good enough because uh, the city went on to um, um, take it on as a permanent intervention and uh, the designs are currently in progress and uh, we've, uh, the the construction was has been a little delayed because of the lockdown but otherwise yeah we're you know hopefully we'll we'll see the street looking like that in a few years. <laughs> And we, it's really interesting in London. We found so it's been a, there's a wonderful uh, approach that people that people are taking is around um, 
around schools. We've got this idea of they're called school streets. So you essentially close the some of the streets around schools at drop off and pick up time. Now in London, about a quarter of a million car journeys every morning are just associated with schools. Yeah, and the, and people dropping off their kids. And a lot of them are local journeys, not all of them. And, and, and I, I recognize that not every journey can be changed, but a huge number are, 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 are things. Now, it's good for kids if they walk and cycle or scoot or however they get there in an active way. But it's good for the environment as well. We, we've been trying that approach. Uh, a few people have been trying that almost using a tactical urbanism approach, very sort of friendly, you know, very temporary measures and that sort of thing. Literally, sometimes just people holding hands across the road, at, at, you know, to close it off and, you know, X, Y, and Z. But it's now become mainstream and we've now rolling out as part of the COVID response, uh, 400 of these to different schools around the city. So we've suddenly got 400 schools that got these sort of clean air, clean air safe roads, uh, enabling people to, to, to walk, walk, and, walk and cycle, which it's, it's, it's quite, you know, you saw in some of my slides, there's an angry reaction against closing roads. But saying that kids should be able to cross the road safely or saying that children should be able to bring breathe in clean air. It's pretty hard to disagree with with, with some of that. <laughs> if you focus, if you can change the argument through children. Yeah. And uh, and you clean up their air, you stop them being hit by cars. In, you know, in, when we're talking about social distancing or trying to keep some space between people at schools, you've got hundreds of people going in through one gate in one space. You need more space to be able to, to do that. So it's been a, you know, it's really, I think that's a really exciting approach that, again, helps change the tone of the conversation. It's, it's, it's very difficult for people to sort of argue against. They do, but it's very difficult to argue against, um, you know, making, 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 <laughs> helping save kids' lives. <laughs> so we touched briefly on like now okay, or will you have been very blank in in your presentation about uh, people not liking the measures and also we touched briefly uh, on the limits of tactical urbanism um, and here I would like to come to the point of the stakeholders involved because still uh, even though we many people see the nice pictures and see the good idea behind that there are many stakeholders involved and will you said shortly that you always need the political will to change, uh, to, to implement such me measures. So I would like to come to the question, okay, which stakeholders are here in the process necessary? How do you get them on board? What, what is your idea? I, so I, you know, this, you can't do this without a different, different group. You need, you need, you need political leadership. You need the councils, you need the political leadership. Uh, you need funding to accompany that clearly but it doesn't it's not compared with other transport modes but you know building a metro or building a road is exceptionally expensive you're talking about a few thousand pounds for some planters it's it's you, but you do need the funding so there's obviously that but then you need the communities and you need campaigners so you need uh, so as well as the technical people to deliver this properly and to, and to do it right I think the the unsung heroes in a lot of this are are campaigners and community activists who are who are so good at um, continuing to to ask for this stuff. They they are they're often critical friends. I prefer they prefer more friendly and less critical to to me. But you know they they're critical friends because they keep pushing us to deliver better and to deliver more and to deliver faster. Yeah. And without that uh, grassroots community piece, whether they are arguing for more cycling or safer roads or cleaner air or more green spaces or uh, less or, or slower speeds on our roads or less road danger or safer lorries, without those, you know, clearly you need the politicians, clearly you need the money, clearly you need the technical experts, but then you need the campaigners. And I think that so much, you know, so much is dependent on them for being the pioneers for driving, driving that change. You need to bring along other people. So there are other people who need to be part of this, whether that is, you need to be talking to the emergency services so that, you know, ambulances and fire trucks can still access and they know the routes. You need to be talking to disability groups because changing the, our, our, our streets and roads can be uh, can be inclusive 
for some people, but the same thing can be excluding others. So you can have things for people who maybe are neurologically diverse, having quieter streets are great, but if you've got a mobility issue and you can't get through, that's a challenge. Or, uh, you know, you need to make sure that there's tactile paving so that visually impaired people can actually move, move, move around. You need to engage people uh, and, and the different stakeholders. But I always think the the unsung heroes in all of this are, are the campaigning groups and, and members of the public and families and people who give up so much time to, to really, really put pressure on people like me to, to do more and to do it faster. But yeah, maybe the architects and urban designers, aren't they? They, they are also important. I, they, they're technically critical because without them, it will look a right mess. Um, so this is this this really uh, hits home, and um, I know that um, in our earlier discussion with Sophia as well, like this is this is something that I I really wanted to bring up, like because um, this is a problem that we all created together, right? and so it really needs all of us to come back together to fix it. Um, and I think as a, as a practice, um, because we're, our, our modus operandi is so rooted in participatory planning, we interact with the entire gamut of stakeholders that uh, we'll just miss it out, right? Like whether it is the, the, the political strata or um, uh, there's, um, there's the city planners and the engineers who are actually, whose job is actually to go out there and put this. Uh, but what we're noticing is that there is a um, there's a there's a capacity deficit in terms of their thinking because you know we've been conditioned for the last 60 years to put in road infrastructure. If there's a problem on the street and there's traffic congestion, you the only the only sort of like immediate solution is to go and put in like an yeah, elevated we'll expressway or something. And we'll put in a, put in more roads, right? Like or widen it or put in a road on top or put in a road below you know um so there's uh, there's uh, there's the, the 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 planners and the engineers and then of course there's the 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 actual end users right like like where's the demand coming from who's asking for this like and then of course the the the, the ones who are actually campaigning for it all the bleeding hearts uh, we work with the disability rights alliance um, group uh, which is which is a, a, a pan india body that uh, has several chapters in several cities um, and and we work with them in terms of um, ensuring public spaces are um, are accessible uh, and that their needs are uh, accommodated as well. So um, we're we're like a like a like a typical day is is you know involves like you know working with all of these people and hearing all of them out. And I think the role that we tend to take uh, is more of a, a facilitator as or an, an enabler, right? Like so, the the activists and the campaigners, is, as as Will pointed out, uh, are critical. But you know, the criticism needs to be channeled in the right way. You know, in a way that it is constructive for uh, city officials to take action on, right? Like if they're just out there on the streets and they're protesting and they're screaming themselves forced because something is not accessible or something is not there you know it it's not going to result in action right so we i, I think we we're, we're kind of in that place where we we were you know taking it all and then like you know packaging it in a way that you know is palatable for everyone and and as well in you know, there's also the political strata where you need to sell a project like this, right? Like it's like there's no will for it. There's not there's not enough money in a project uh, that is focused on walking and cycling as there is money, quick money in a project that is, uh, you know, dealing with road infrastructure and putting in more roads. Like, and that's something that they know how to do. They've they've spent 60 years doing it. Like. And and they and and you know, if there's a problem, that's the only way they know to fix it. And you know, so getting them like to the the we, we spoke about a shift in mindset and i think that shift in mindset is across all of these levels you know like right from the political struggle to the to the engineers to the planners to uh you know the people and uh you know the activists like everybody um i think you know there's there's you know there's like um there, there's a buzz but 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 the buzz needs to be channeled and um our practice, I think, you know, over the last um, decade or so, we've been really involved in helping 
to realize some of these in a way that is amenable to all of these parties and it's it's not easy <laughs> yeah but i think this idea you 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 said an interesting phrase there is selling this yeah and it's i think you like it, there, there are stakeholders who might be that, that you know that you can divide up the stakeholders there's stakeholders who want this and there's stakeholders who quite frankly don't want it yeah and uh, and there are some people who are in the middle and, you know, often the ones who actively don't want it. I don't really see how you're going to change people's minds on that. But I often, you know, they're usually in the minority, but it's the middle bit where I, you know, where, where I think is most interesting. The, the people who really haven't made up their mind. But I think we all have a role to play in how this gets sold. So clearly there's a transportation sort of argument to this uh, and a mobility piece. But often there are so many other arguments. We've used the, for, for a lot of decision makers, the health argument is really powerful. Um, so the fact that if people are physically active, they're 20% less, you know, they're 20% less likely to die of all forms of morbidity. You know, it's, it, it literally is, you couldn't invent a drug that's better than being physically active, yeah? If you think about anti-cancer, heart disease, depression, uh, diabetes, arthritis, being active is a good thing for all of that, which will, you know, which will save our health system uh, in, or our health systems, plural, irrespective of where you are. Um, so that is a good, you know, that's something that we've got as a, as a very powerful piece of evidence. There's a business argument for this. We often hear opposition from people who own small businesses uh, and they will actually, this is going to reduce the number of people getting to my, my shops, yeah. for example. There is research that's been done everywhere in the world, you know, or different parts of the world. And as soon as I show people bits of research from a different, well, that's, that's New York, that's not London. That's exactly. that's not, you know. <laughs> so lo and behold, we do it in London. Yeah? What we find is that when there are walking and cycling schemes in, then there is a 40% increase in spending in local shops because people walk fast and they stop and go in and buy something. Um, you have 17% fall in number of empty retail outlets, so the, the empty buildings. You know that is good for local businesses. That's good for local economies. It's the you know the air. I find it in London. We've been doing an awful lot to improve air quality. I've, I find that climate change is a is sometimes far further removed from people's you know they see fires in California or they see flooding in uh, you know I don't know in Mozambique or they they see something that's very far removed. But air you know the, the the air quality is something that affects their kids in their school or your house and the when you open a window that's what comes in through and into directly into your lungs. We can tackle the climate change piece by tackling the same causes of air quality because 27% of our carbon emissions come through the transport system. Yeah. If we can have cleaner ways, but so part of this is how we phrase and what evidence we use to, uh, to make the point for different stakeholder groups. And I think it's really important that we don't just think that one single fact is going to, uh, to, to, to influence everybody. Absolutely. If it's also, yeah. There is also the point that actually facts are helpful, but they don't always change people's minds. You need stories. And there's a storytelling piece to this of individual people and the experiences that they've gone through and making this not just about a sort of PhD student sort of presenting their findings, but actually how this has changed an individual's life. Yeah. And an individual yeah. that you could like, relate to having me, the walking and cycling commissioner saying to everyone in London, you should walk and cycle more. That's not really news. But if you have people who are on the TV, you have business people, you have doctors, you have mums who are present, I don't know, a TV show or on the radio talking about this, you need a network of champions talking about this who people will, will listen to. That's, I think, yeah, a nice I... sentence to now go over, sorry, Vidya, to our question and answers, a network of champions, and I'm quite sure we have a lot of participants here uh, who have a lot of interesting questions for you. So, I, due to time reasons, sorry, Vidya, we will dive into those questions now, and therefore I have... Oh, no, I just, to... I, just, um, I just wanted to say one thing that, you know, um, whenever we're trying to sell, sell the idea, I think... Um, you know, it's 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 never about statistics, but it's about how personal you can make it. And 
you've got to make it personal for each of the stakeholders. So the the it's it's literally personalizing it for the you know for, for all the different stakeholders that we're dealing with. So I, I, I was just kind of like reflecting on what we were saying, and as like this is what we do as well. <laughs> Great, but now I hand over to my colleague Lina. She has monitored and clustered the questions, so I hand over to Lina mod moderating the questions. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks so much for that inspiring discussion. You've sparked quite some questions that are coming your way now. Um, so, well, here's one that's quite particular, which I want to direct to you. Nathaniel asks, um, he's curious about the bike lane bypass that you mentioned. Are cyclists usually civil when commuters are boarding and alighting since they will have to cross the bypass to do so? Yeah. So, um, I think this has been, a, you know, the, when you bring in new innovative bits of infrastructure into a city, it takes time to adjust. And we've had these bus stop bypasses for some time uh, in London. So I think the first ones went in in about 2015. So for the past five years, we've, we've been having these come in. And as we develop them, we've been learning. Not every, not, you know, for, for some people, it becomes when the bus, everyone comes off the bus and then they're crossing a cycle lane. Initially, it's like, whoa, this is a bit scary. Um, so we've changed the design as we've gone through it. So we did some video studies to actually understand. We tried different things and we did video cameras to understand what behaviours were coming out of this. And what we've now factored in is putting in humps, uh, raised humps to slow the site, you know, so cyclists slow down and put in uh, zebra crossings. Uh, so uh, zebra crossings to show that there's pedestrian priority. Uh, it's gone in with tactile pavement so people with visual impairments can, can get across. Now. The evidence shows that it's they are not they're not there's no significant danger to this and there aren't that, there aren't many incidents of, of 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 collisions happening there. But some people still feel that they are not as safe as they could be. So this is something we've got to continue to to work on. But for the most part, uh, people do. I wish to I wish that every cyclist was civil, uh, but that isn't the case. Like just as every motorist isn't civil and every pedestrian isn't civil, uh, and there's not a lot I can do uh, do about everybody. But I think what we need to do is continue to work on the designs to make them as safe as possible. Mm, fair point. Yeah. Um, I have two questions: one from Andrea and one from Jana that go in a similar direction. So they are interested in how you deal with opposition in political leadership when implementing these innovative measures. So how do you, uh, you know, engage these people to support um, kind of a mind shift that you're trying to bring to the city? Uh, Betty, do you want to start? Yeah, I, can... I, I, can, I, I can take it. So uh, what, what we do is, uh, I mean, of course, um, it, I, I think you know, it's really important to find the right collaborations and that's, pretty much how we get anything done you know like uh so there's different levels of governance you know i mean it's not you just have to find the right set of people that are interested in in promoting um non-motorized transport walking and cycling and uh so as a practice too you know we're we're happy to work with any you know any of the range of stakeholders like whether it's an activist group or a resident association homeowners association or uh, you know, um, uh, a, a local councillor who, who's, who's interested, or if it is the city's commissioner, or if it is coming directly. So I think in terms of our work, we've worked with several different stakeholders. It's just about finding the, you know, the, the right fit of people that are interested to move this forward. Um, and it, and it could it and the 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 impetus could come from anywhere. That's, that's what I'm saying. I, I guess the. The approach that we take is to just keep our eyes peeled for who's who's out there who's, who wants to push this and then and then help them do it. So this is a this is a problem. You know, this is a, a problem around the world. I, I was in Amsterdam last uh, last year before all of this nasty COVID stuff, up, and I you know I always look to parts of the Netherlands and the work that they do, and with it's just like wow, that some of that stuff is fantastic. But I was talking to one of the planners and they had had a, a, a similar opposition to a new scheme that we had had in, in, in London. And so, but I, I think there are a number of things that we certainly do. I think the key thing is spending time and engaging and continuing to work with people, even if they are opposed, opposed, opposed to you. 
listing their concerns, changing and tweaking designs on permanent schemes is important and show they've been listening. We don't get it right with the, the, the drawings first time. Why, why should we? You know, it's, it, it's ridiculous to think that everything we will do is, is going to be perfect. But that is where the consultation and the engagement is, is, is so important. All those, then there is a then, so consultation, engagement, talking to people, building local support. Um, you know, that's why, again, why I talk about the activists and the campaigners who I can't be at every school gate or in every pub talking about the benefits of this. So, but I, what I can do is provide the evidence, provide the facts, because usually when these things go in, a lot of myths are created. You know, suddenly, mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to create more. Air, for some reason bike lanes create more air quality problems, or you know that uh, suddenly they go. They, you know, the people are going to get start getting run over by bicycles, and that's going to become really dangerous. Or uh, that you know, there are all sorts of myths that come come out. So providing the evidence and the talking points for other people to be able to make those cases is is a really important piece. Um, Recognize, and, and then you're not going to change everybody's mind, but it makes, with, with proper evidence and facts, it begins to make some of those arguments against things harder. Um, we come back to some of the discussions we just had. You know, if, it, if it, people aren't going to cycle, do they want, you know, do they want, so just talking about cycling is wrong. I think walking and cycling is, is really important. This needs to be as inclusive as possible. And actually, you know, getting kids to walk to school is a really important thing, and not many people can argue against it. So it's quite how, it's how the arguments are made, how much engagement and consultation happens. It's also recognizing that you can't win every fight. Uh, and, uh, you know, you could spend all your life fighting for one particular scheme. Uh, my approach is, you know, well, you've got to you, you fight as much as you can, but I, I want to get stuff delivered. And what we what we repeatedly find is telling the story of successes helps. Yeah. So, for example, I showed some pictures of one area called uh, called Waltham Forest, where people have got the, the, these low traffic neighbours, and then their neighbours say, well, why why haven't we got that? That's not fair. Yeah. Why why can they listen to birdsong on their streets? Why have they? Why is air quality in that neighbourhood? below the European legal limit and it isn't in mine, you know? And if you can tell those stories, what my what my why is my cafe busier? Why is my why isn't my cafe as busy as his cafe around the corner? And it's like, well actually, if you can tell the stories of success and keep on sharing those success stories, show the changes that these are making, not just to the city, but to individuals' lives and communities, then I think it helps build up that 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 pressure. And then there's a sort of, it's almost like a, as the stone gets, you know, as a snowball gets bigger, it begins to roll on its own. And that's the point where we need to get it to. There will always be fights. There will always be challenges. There will always be people who are worried and fearful of change. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't change things for the better, because really we haven't got a choice. You know, what do we want? Do we want our cities to be, to become gridlocked and, and, and for everybody to become, unhealthy and for everyone to be breathing toxic air no nobody wants that uh, so we do need to change it and uh, and 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 you know but there is always there is always opposition so you're basically it's encouraging that. everyone to get on the support train instead of yeah. um, and, and everybody has a role to play in this so if if you like something tell a local councillor your local politician your mayor that you like it if you don't like it or if you want if you don't think it's good enough say look i really like bike lanes i just don't think this one's good enough i think this is how it could be improved so just keep on a lot of politicians who want to deliver this expend a lot of their political capital doing it and if they then just get shot down to saying actually what you've delivered isn't good enough all the time they won't do it again so from a sort of public and a campaigner's perspective there's a tone that really helps win over councillors which is like we love this stuff. We want to see more of it. Yeah, we love this stuff. We think that this could be improved by doing X, Y, and Z. We love this stuff. Thank you for doing this. Could you do some more a bit faster? Yeah, rather than saying you're not going fast enough. This isn't good enough. And they're like, well, if you think that, why should I put my neck on the line next time? So that 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 is very important. Mm. I like that idea of positive reinforcement to really see the change happening. I actually have here a question for Vidya from uh, Maxime, one of our uh, Lviv city representatives, one of our partners from the Tuli Summer School. He asks, or he, he's describing, in Lviv they also have troubles with the proper infrastructure for bike users. 
Sometimes he says the bike lanes just end in nowhere or they just end in the middle of the road. And because of the small city budget, they are not able to invest in the continuation of that infrastructure. Uh, they believe in tactical urbanism to create at least temporary solutions. But he's wondering if you have any recommendations from your experience in India to deal with that infrastructure problem and increase the number of cyclists in the city, especially when you have a very low uh, city budget. Um. I mean, this is this is really tricky. I mean, we 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 don't have a budget as well, you know. I mean, we're, we're, there's always a budget constraint for putting in dedicated cycle lane infrastructure. And as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, while cities are interested in putting a public bike sharing system, they're they're still not interested in putting in the dedicated infrastructure that even allows the public bike sharing system to be a success, you know. So it's like you're only putting in one piece of the puzzle and then and then wondering why it's not why it's failing. I mean. Bike sharing systems have been failing across so many cities, and the answer is right there in front of you. And yet, uh, you know, I mean, the the sensible thing to do would be to to do it right with the bike sharing system. And yet, I mean, I, it it really escapes me why you know some of the most obvious solutions are not you know uh, absorbed. Um, I in fact I think it's it's um, um, it's um, very appreciative that uh, in Lviv they're looking at temporary interventions in the absence of a budget, and I think that's already like a win-win situation. Hopefully, you know, with more patronage and more usage of those te of the temporary infrastructure, you know, there there would be motivation to um, to make it permanent. Um, I just again in continuation uh, from the previous question as well, I just wanted to also highlight another thing that we we've been doing of late, like. We we'll spoke about uh, the need to continue to talk about success stories. Uh, one of the things that we've been doing uh, recently is actually engaging with media houses and asking them to do coverage of successful projects, uh, so that there's there's more of a reach and there's you know there's you know you start making it uh, you know um, a viable um, option for people to uh, to seek and demand uh, in you know going forward. Uh, so that's something again, you know, like on the lines of building your allies, like you know, you you can start building that pressure by by approaching media houses. So we're getting a lot of uh, press press friends to write about it, uh, to to about what's working, what's not working. If there's infrastructure that's put in and it's not working, then you know, again, in a very constructive way, we're also highlighting, you know, what could be improved. Um, I think um, the thing that puts off most of the the city officials is if if the if the energy is not channeled the right way, and I and I think that applies to any of us. You know, I mean, if someone's just standing in front of you and just screaming and and you know not communicating the right way, you know, it 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 can be very frustrating. You know? Like, but I think it's 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 important to be able to you know. Um, channel that in a, in, a, in a constructive manner and put it across as recommendations and not as criticism like you know like if it's not working do you have an idea of what can what can make it work and i think you know city officials tend to tend to start getting interested they'll pay attention to you they'll give you their ears if you're able to tell them you know what they can actually do instead of just just telling them what is not working i like come in on that question Sorry, yeah, please. Uh, yeah, I, you know, to that point around, you know, bike lanes stopping in places. This is this this is a problem in London. You know that uh, if you, I, I, I took a journalist out on a bike ride, and I, I showed them all this beautiful infrastructure. And I, at the beginning of the bike ride, I said, "Will you tell me where you think the political boundary is between two areas?" Now, one area is famously very positive for cycling. And one area is very famous for not being. And, and I said at the beginning of this bike ride, tell me. And he shouted out at exactly the right moment because it looks completely arbitrary. The bike lane stops. But that is down to a political boundary. Yeah. And nobody, re most people who live in cities have no idea where the political boundaries are. It just doesn't matter. I, you know, I live in London. I can go here, here and here. And it's just London. But actually from a from a technical perspective, those political boundaries suddenly become very clear. So that's one thing. The second voice is that all schemes have to stop somewhere. Yeah, you know, you, you can't suddenly have a, you can't dream, you can't de deliver a full network in in one go. So I think there is needs to be 
the thought put into where do things stop and how do you do that as safely as you possibly can but they will all have to stop you know one of the criticisms that i always get is this is great but why doesn't it go on to here well because i haven't got the budget for it to go onto there or that we haven't designed it up to there or, or so all schemes have to stop somewhere um but let's try and build make sure that they stop as safely as possible but also you know we are trying to build a network we have a plan for a network we can't build it all at once so let's build parts of it and then we'll as they get busier and as people see the benefits then it becomes easier and easier to fill in the gaps in in that network so i think it's what's important is to have a plan to have a strategic plan of what you want to get to yeah and say right we will build this and and build it as much as we can as fast as we can now some bits are much easier than others because there might be a very wide road or there might be some existing space or an existing path that needs improvement. There might be some bits that go under a railway bridge and it's really very, very, it's sort of physics, just make it impossible to do that. Now, what do you do? Do you not do the whole scheme because it's got one narrow piece or you know, there's a degree of compromise as well and that's, then we return to it as our thinking develops or as the roads change or as traffic drops or, or, or what have you. But I think the key thing is having that strategic plan delivering as much as you can where you can in a coherent way but recognizing that you can't deliver everything at once i have to say maxim is also being a bit modest here because the city of Lviv has actually made quite some progress in that sense that they have strategically identified where they need to start building that infrastructure but he he does have a question for you as well actually because i think uh, i mean for them too that's a very important point in the city so he asks if uh, because you've shown a picture for the tactical urbanism intervention that you've done and he asks if you have any policy regulations or any you know guidelines in the city of london that you use and apply when you use tactical urbanism uh, yes, so we have a, um, uh, a whole raft of technical design guidance that uh, that we that we have both for permanent measures and for uh, temporary measures. Um, there's less uh, guidance, I think, at the moment around some of the tactical urbanism stuff, but we're developing more of it. Um, but all of that is available if you go to the Transport for London website, uh, tfl.gov.uk. Um, they, we have the, what's called the London Cycling Design Guidance, which is, you know, it's, it's. I think it's in the UK. It's, you know, it's, it's the best. It's the best that's available in, in the UK, and people can use that and share that. But we do have some principles of that I think are, are true everywhere. So um, some of the guiding principles are that if it's a busy road, there's there's a limit to the number of cars. That if if it's above a certain number of vehicles per hour then cycling facilities need to be se physically segregated and physically separated from that traffic. If you can reduce the number of cars and you have quieter streets, then there are other measures that you can play in. There are measures around the width, there are measures around the materials, there are measures around the times that traffic lights and X, Y, and Z. So all of that is available and you know, we're happy to share it if, if, if that would be useful. Great to know that it's accessible on your website. We'll be sure to also post that website uh, as a follow-up to this webinar. Yeah. Um, I have another question from Andrea for the both of you. Um, she's asking, how can you encourage the new use of streets as a permanent state? How can it be built as a narrative to strengthen that idea and motivate decision makers to keep promoting the transformation with citizens as a priority? Vijay, do you want to go first? Um, so, how do we make this permanent with with citizens as a priority, is that is that what you said? I think so. The, the general idea is how do you engage citizens in a way that you know there's basically no way around making the changes permanent and and kind of you know setting it in stone that now you've you've maybe done these these uh, temporary measures, but they're actually already accepted for good. Um, um I could start if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I'll let you take it first. It's a very good question. It's something we're battling at the moment. We've, you know, yeah. we've just in the last four months, we've five months, we've rolled out 80 kilometers of cycle lanes as a temporary measure, using temporary legislation. You know, um, how do we get that to make that permanent? We have to consult the public. We have to engage people, but we also need to, you know, we we have to modify it and and, and change it. Uh, it's it's not going. It's not necessarily easy to shift from 
permanent to uh, from temporary to permanent, uh, both in terms of the politics and the engagement piece, but also in terms of the cost, because actually digging up the roads and changing, putting in our permanent cycle lanes involves changing the curb lines, the drainage, the electrical, uh, the the gas supplies, the our Wi-Fi, you know, the the broadband fiber optic cables and all all of that stuff becomes it's very easy to put some plastic wands down building permanent cycle lanes becomes more expensive so there's a sort of uh, there is a there is a an engagement piece for the public and then there is a technical budgetary piece of how we can and uh, how we can do that and and andrea asked an excellent question and it's one i don't have the answer to maybe if i come back next year um I'll be able to <laughs> say how we've made all this stuff permanent, but at the moment, <laughs> this is one of the things we're working on, and it's a very, very live issue. We'll be sure to follow up then. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I think we're, we, we, we really should have this conversation again next year, just to see where we're all at with this. Like, um, um, because I think it, it, it's safe to say that we're we're at a at a juncture where the change is like happening. You know, there's you know the, the the conversations are are really sort of heating up, and we're seeing um, more people involved in this. Um, and uh, uh, we don't have a sort of um, uh, what do you say a mandate for participation, or rather, we we do. Although we do have uh, constitutional laws that encourage public participation in public projects, there are very few of very few consultations do happen. Um, and particularly in the case of projects related to non-motorized transport, I think it's it's really rare because one thing, you know, there's budgetary constraints uh, for projects of this nature. Uh, I think cities are still struggling to find funding to make all of these permanent interventions. Uh, all the cities that we work with, uh, you know, have the same problems, you know, like they're, they're you know, sort of uh, struggling to find, um, you know, this road space. Uh, and prioritize uh, non-motorized transport in the road in the existing road space that they have. The 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 tendency is still to uh, you know um, give the lanes to the cars, um, and uh, you know and and there's still so much apprehension towards um, segregating um, lanes for pedestrian and, and cycle movement. Um, so. I think it's a really big shift simply because we're looking at temporary interventions uh, to incorporate these in our street sections right now uh, in Indian cities. Uh, so, you know, it really remains to be seen where we will go, uh, you know, with this. And and I am really curious to see how much of the temporary interventions do become permanent interventions in a year's time. Uh, so, yeah, I, you know, it's, it's, um, um, uh, there's there's a lot of um, so many other uh, issues and and again you know I think the question on funding you know really got me thinking as well like because when when the person um, I think it was Maxine who asked about you know what do you do when when you run out of funding um, and I think as as a as a practitioner one of the challenges that we have is also to figure out um, ways to um, fund the project you know like for instance earlier today we were in conversation. Uh, with um, the commissioner who's in charge of um, the, the disabled uh, access uh, uh, in our streets and public spaces. And so we were we were having this conversation about how we can retrofit public spaces, uh, particularly the beach in our city. And, um, and then the conversation went into funding and then they were like, maybe we can pull in some funding from the road safety division, you know, and use that to make the retrofit that suits disabled friendly access, right? So there's also, I, I think um, it, it, it's also a creative process. Like, I mean, I see the challenge more as a creative process, you know, where we're all in a problem solving mode, you know, you're, you're trying to find the money, you're trying to find the will, you're trying to find the allies who will help you make this happen. Um, and I think that pretty much defines uh, the work that we do uh, as well here. Mm -hmm. I have one last question for the both of you, which I think is quite an interesting question. I've never, to be honest, I don't have thought about it in that particularly. So Bhakti asks, when you're trying to get people to walk and cycle more rather than using motorized transport, 
is there a difference in your approach if you're doing it in a city like London where people predominantly would use a car rather than, for example, an Asian city where people might be using motorcycles and other forms of motorized transport more? So does that change how you, how you design your strategy to get them into active mobility? It's really difficult because you're both in that particular context, but I think we have the perfect panelists to kind of maybe dig into that issue a little bit. But yeah, I saw you nodding. Do you have a like a first sense of response to this question? Yeah, a lot of um, uh, Indian cities do have a very high volume of two wheelers. And in fact, one of the problems that we face is that, you know, when we put in infrastructure, if at all we manage to find the funds to put in infrastructure for walking and cycling, they get taken over by two wheelers. And this is a problem that's very real and something that we have to deal with all the time, right? Like, so, you know, we're right now like prototyping designs of sidewalks and cycle infrastructure that that allows only pedestrians and uh, persons with disabilities to use them rather than have two wheelers to sort of overtake all of this as their own you know like um so yeah i mean you know it's it's always like um uh, you know there there's there, there's there's so many different kinds of challenges like you know, even after you find, like I said, even after you find the money to put in the infrastructure, it's not used by the right kind of people, like like by the by the actual stakeholders that you intended to put them in for. Like, so um, yeah, I uh, as I said, I think uh, you know um, the approach is to look at every challenge as um, every problem as an opportunity uh, to create something uh, and to push the boundaries. Uh, either through uh, through design or through governance or through policy or uh, whatever it is, whatever it takes, you know, like whether it's a campaign that is required to make this change happen. Uh, it, you know, you never know, you know, you've got to have a multi-pronged approach is what I always say, you know, it's, it's, it's never like, you know, oh, this city did this, it's going to work somewhere else or, you know, oh, look, I can you know, uh, this is this is the the only solution. I've got a problem, and this this is a solution that works somewhere else, and it's going to work here. Like, no, uh, the uh, our cities are so uh, intrinsically uh, different in their DNA. You know, the sociocultural and the socioeconomic makeup of the cities, and uh, you know, the the public perceptions towards non-motorized transport are all so different uh, that you know each city requires a very contextual solution that we need to be uh, thinking of. Like. So the, the, the problems are unique. The solutions need to be as unique as well. I, I would go further than that. I, I'd say every area of the city is is is, is 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 a different context. So you know, if you look at London, I've got, I've got a map behind me. You know, this this central area is is you know is is the probably some of the busiest pavements uh, for walking in the country. You know, uh, we've got the busiest bike lanes in, in the country in, in that area. We've got, you know, 90% of the journeys going into that spot there are by walking, cycling and public transport. But if you live out in this area, yeah, which is outer London, you have a very, very different, uh, you know, it's much more car dominated. So for each area, we need a different strategy. Um, and, you know, for, for, for our central and sort of inner London, it's about how do we get more people out of the cars to walking and, and cycling. But actually, I don't think that that's actually, you know, some of the distances and some of the infrastructure in, in outer London isn't that isn't the best way of doing that. So can we get people to use more active travel to get to public transport? So instead of driving all the way, can we get people to walk and cycle to that, make it safe for them to walk and cycle to their local train station or their local bus, bus station and then use a more sustainable, greener, cleaner way of public transport to do that on, onward going? So our strategies need to be different for the different areas of the city given the existing infrastructure that's available but also the the the, 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 the predominant mode share in those in those different areas so i agree with video that it is, is very context specific in different cities but even within a city it is a uh, it is it is context specific and ultimately i think you're right it, it, each street has you know there is not a single solution for a single city, there's not a thing. Well, there's not a single solution for all urban areas. There's not a single solution for every city. There's not a single solution for every area of every city. There's not a single solution for every street. You know, it is down to context, and that's why it, this makes these jobs very interesting, but also challenging at times. 
Okay, thank you, uh, all of you, Vidya, Will, and Lina, for the question part. And I think, uh, yes, you said a nice closing word, there is no one size fits all kind of uh, solution. Um, but I guess or hope that this webinar helped us all uh, to, to find or to have more input for our strategies, how to sell walking and cycling measures. Um, and I hope to see you guys in one year when we all know and how found out how we uh, <laughs> made <laughs> the temporary uh, counter COVID-19 measures in walking and cycling permanent. So thank you all for being part of this webinar and I wish all of the participants a good night, a good morning, a good afternoon, wherever you are, and hopefully see you again with the Transformative Urban Mobility Initiatives webinar. So thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Thanks for very having much. me. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Have a good day.